Greetings and welcome from Atmajaya Catholic University of Indonesia to all of us. My name is Ignatius Rainer. Today, I will facilitate this webinar as Master of Ceremony. First of all, let's say thanks to God, the Lord of the world, the Lord of the universe, who has been giving us his blessing so that we can gather in this virtual seminar. Good morning and welcome to the second international lecture series online held under the initiative of NUNI in collaboration between University of Binus, Islamic University of Indonesia, Andalas University, Satya Wacana Christian University, and Atmajaya Catholic University of Indonesia. Our seminar today will present the topic, People with Disabilities and the New Normal. Before starting our virtual seminar, allow me to convey some information. During the seminar, you can only write your question on the available chat rooms. We are mute your microphone for our convenience. Please open your camera and change your participant's name as follow. Home University, your name, and your student ID. Make sure you join as scheduled. Latecomer with participation duration less than 80% is considered ineligible to earn SIT points. During Q&A session, questions are allowed after the speaker's presentation. Questions are put in chat rooms. All student participants must complete exit ticket required to get e-certificate. The link is given in the end of this session. Thank you for your kind cooperation. The next agenda, I will introduce you to Mr. Doni Eros as our moderator today. Good morning, sir. Can you hear my voice? Yes, good morning, yeah. I can hear you. Before we start, allow me to read her curricul her, his curriculum vitae. Mr. Doni Eros is well experienced on the teaching specialist with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry. He has got his master of art focused in film and literature from University of Essex. Known as a brilliant researcher with a style of expression that very energetic and passionate, outstanding interpersonal skills makes his known as a problem solver inside and outside his expertise. He is currently assigned at Andalas University as Secretary of International Office. Well now to Mr. Doni Eros, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rainer. Mm, I think I need to clarify some information due, uh, to my introductions. It was very interesting introductions. Um, you're making me very proud of myself. <laughs> but um, I, I think I need to clarify some. Uh, first, I, I was in the international office as the secretary to Ibu Foni, but um, during the pandemic, uh, I had another um, urge of doing something else. Then uh, we, uh, I withdraw, but, but I'm still uh, helping in the international office whatsoever. And also, um, yeah, I think that thing that I need to clarify. And enough about me. I would like to introduce our very interesting speaker for today. Yeah? Um, I would like everybody to uh, know our um, speaker, Ibu Sengjukta Choduri uh, Kaul. Yeah? Uh, 
Yeah, your name is actually very familiar to me, Choduri. Uh, this is the name of the one who taught me the theory in film when I was in when I was studying in the UK. <laughs> she was the head of the department at the time. But um, uh, for your information, everyone, Ibu uh, Sanjukta is uh, a lecturer and. Uh, Binus University in Jakarta. She is uh, specialized in business ethic. Also, her master degree, uh, she took her master degree in um, what is it? Um, wait, in the Nottingham University. And she also, she has two master degree. She also had a master degree on communication studies from University of Pune, India. And she has a specific uh, expertise in corporate social responsibility from Nottingham University Business School. And her PhD is uh, School of Business from Monash University. She, is, uh, she wrote a thesis, very interesting one, Business, Disabilities and Corporate Social Responsibility, the Indian Experience, which is to me uh, very special. Um, our speaker, uh, has gone through a lot in her life. <laughs> she has been 10 years in, uh, in the industry before she turns into a lecturer in, in Venus and uh, uh, turn herself into uh, the academic life. But what is most impressive from her is um, she had, uh, uh, she lost her hearings. So everybody, that's why you need to uh, type your questions in the chat room because um, our speakers can only read your lips to understand what you are saying. So I'll help you to uh, tell our speakers later your questions. And three questions, three best questions will, uh, will be given a door prize at the end of this uh, uh, sessions. But um, what is impressive uh, from our speaker is that how she cope with this uh, new conditions into make, making it into something very special to her because I actually, uh, what do you call it? Jealous at this ability, <laughs> the ability to read lips, you know, that's a very useful, very useful nowadays. And <laughs> it's like blessing in this guy somehow. <laughs> so, uh, and now she is, uh, she's, 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 I mean, she will be talking about uh, how the life of disability during the pandemic, especially because she can only read lips and everybody is using masks. <laughs> so it must be a very uh, challenging situation uh, for uh, Miss uh, Sanju. So that's what we are going to call her uh, during this. And uh, let's, Without further ado, um, I would like Ms. Anju to proceed to your presentation. So she will be having like around 40 minute presentation and it's gonna be very interesting. So everybody please uh, pay attention to that. You're not going to have it anywhere else and from anyone else. This is like very unique to her. So please Ms. Anju, uh, welcome. Thank you, Pakiro for a warm welcome and a summary and your words of kindness. Uh, I thank uh, the NUNI and, and all the participating university, including my colleague Dora for this wonderful platform uh, where I can share some of my work that I'm doing. I welcome uh, all, almost I see 189 participants, which is very interesting. I don't know whether it is for the university points or you are genuinely interested in disability, but I'm going to try my best to uh, make some shift in your thinking or your understanding of what disability is and how people with disabilities are coping during the COVID-19 situation, all right? So please allow me now to uh, share my screen. Uh, I hope you're all able to see my screen. 
So uh, just to, before I start, uh, a little bit I would like to talk is that uh, my name actually is Sanjukta Chaudhary Kaur. It's an Indian name. I can, I'm known as Boo Sanju. And I've been with Venus for the last five years. Venus is my first academic job since I finished my PhD from Monash uh, Business School. And I live in Indonesia uh, with my family uh, and a teenage son, my husband and uh, my teenage son, uh, which is out there. Uh, I'm also a person with disability. So I'm bisensorially deaf, which means I cannot hear anything in my two years. I'm almost 90% deaf and I have about eight microphones uh, that I typically use. So now that I am engaging in a dialogue with you is I have some special equipments that allow me to engage in this conversation, which is out there. And I teach in the international business program at the Sinai uh, campus, which is out there. So uh, my dear friends and colleague, uh, today's session, I would like to talk to you about what is disability? You know, so we all seem to know, oh, disabled, you know, person with disability, but what does it really mean? And uh, I would like to talk to you about what the COVID-19 and challenges of people with disability are. And what does new normal mean for people with disability? Uh, so what I'm doing there for in a sense is creating a subpopulation within the larger population of people, you know, disabled people and trying to put the kind of spotlight that you have. You know, I really like this picture that I have put out here of this girl. She has this mask. Uh, this was around, I think, May. Uh, so the, we started having a lockdown in March, on March 18th was the first day that my university, along with the universities announced a lockdown in Jakarta. And uh, we were supposed to just get, start working from home and doing that and or come to work wearing a mask. For me, that became an instant nightmare. You know, how am I going to read people's faces? And in my mind, I'm thinking that in Indonesia, we always get things little late. So I'm Googling Singapore and Malaysia and Australia to see, do they have something that people like me can get to work with? And I find nothing. And this girl, she posted a picture, uh, she's a student, that she has come up with these masks. You know, she's just stitching and there are very few available. Of course, now they're available on Tokopedia the local version and the price is about 130,000 Indonesian rupiah compared to a normal mask, which is 15,000 rupiah. But just to show you what the panic of disability meant for people like me, you know, when the pandemic, uh, when the pandemic started, which is out there. All right, let's see how do we know disability. Most of us know disability in historical terms. So, our large part of disability comes from the inability, not from the ability. So if you were to open up our uh, religious books in any religion, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, any religion you will see, you will see the whole term comes, or the whole approach is that of healing, the miracle, the cure, right? That's where the traditional understanding of disability comes from. So we see words like crippled, monstrosity, diseased, afflicted, imbeciles, handicapped, dumb. So you are kind of always traditionally reinforcing in disability what it cannot do, what it is not. And you assume, we assume that that one element of disability becomes the personality of that person, right? So we say he's dumb. Maybe he's not dumb. He cannot speak. Maybe he's very intelligent. But what we do is that becomes the element of identity. There's nothing right or wrong. I'm just trying to say that that is how historically disability has been understood. 
And then we see is this effort of trying to put labels around disability, right? So what do I mean by labels? Labels, I don't mean uh, Gucci or Louis Vuitton or, you know, uh, Prada. There are other types of labels, right? We see labels like mentally retarded, autism, bipolar, right? Wheelchair bound. We try to label people. Why do we label people? Because it becomes a social coding, right? It's easier for me then to understand something what I think is abnormal. So I'm, I'm normal, right? As a human being, able-bodied people will say, I'm normal, everything is fine. You know, everything is great. Suddenly I meet a person on wheelchair, I don't know how to react with them. But if I may tell them that the person on wheelchair does X, Y, Z things, then I, every time I meet a person on wheelchair, I have a social code. So I know how to behave with them. Without understanding that two people on wheelchair can be two different personalities, right? So that's where the labeling process starts. And what we see therefore, the term disability is a very new construct. It's a new term. So traditionally, disability has existed under very divergent umbrellas. So if people were blind, they never bothered about people who were hearing impaired or people who had mental problems because all these problems are different. So they were scattered. Suddenly, we see in this 1970s onwards, it's about 30, 40 years that we started creating a common umbrella term of disability. And within the larger term of disability, we located these different types of problems that exist in the society. Now, I'm using the word problem. The important thing is from whose perspective is the problem, right? The social perspective is that people with disabilities are societal issues or their societal problems, which is out there. So if we look at the term disability, it refers to any condition of the body or mind, which is an impairment that makes it difficult for the person with the condition to do some activity. Very important word is to do certain activities and interact with the world around them, right? It doesn't mean that I cannot do many things. I must share a very interesting incident here to illustrate my point. During my PhDs, when I was interviewing people and uh, I did a qualitative study of Indian information technology companies. So if I disclosed at the start to people that, you know, I cannot, I'm uh, disabled, I cannot hear. If there was an able-bodied person, they would get very nervous. On several occasions, people would offer me a chair and say, please sit down, but I'm not sick, right? because they think that if I'm disabled, I'm sick. No, it just restricts certain things. That does not mean that they are being biased or they're stereotyping. It just means that they didn't have exposure to other people with disabilities. So they really don't know how they should react. Sometimes when I tell people I'm a person with disability, it happens with all my friends, people start laughing on the other side because they just don't know how to express their emotions, which is out there, right? So it means disability largely would mean that person uh, with the condition to do certain activities that kind of restricts them. Okay, uh, what we are also seeing is that disability has three types of dimensions to it. One is impairment. So there is a difference between impairment activity limitations and participation restrictions that we see. So we need to understand that when we are talking or about people with disability, especially in the COVID part of it, it doesn't mean that the person is completely not able to do anything which is out there. Of course, there are limitations out there. So impairment is a person's body structure function. Impairment, loss of blame, loss of vision, memory loss, you know, that's fear facing, that is kind of stopping me or preventing me from doing something. That comes to the activity limitation. So because I don't have the ears of the impairment, my listening activity is 
limited. So that's where the impairment and activity limitation gets linked. And then we see participation restrictions. So in my case, I cannot watch television if there are no closed captions. I cannot hear any YouTube videos or I cannot do any phone calls. I cannot talk to you through Zoom because it creates a participation restriction. Now, what is important in the disability studies is we say, well, the impairment is mine, but activity limitation and more so participation restriction is not my problem. It's the problem of the society. So for example, I don't feel my participation restriction is there on Zoom because Zoom allows me to chat, right? So what it happens, you find that the participation becomes possible through inclusive or adaptable features in the system, which is out, right? So a lot of the pressure back today on the society is to create more participation for people with disability in different spheres through, uh, through increasing participatory, removing the barriers for participation, uh, restrictions which is out there. Uh, okay, so to share with you, uh, a question is, you begin to wonder, do people with disability need any attention? Uh, do we need to really think of them as important people? 15% of the world population lives with some form of disability or the other. It's, it's the largest diversity group other than gender. So the men-women ratio is one, but the diversity group of people with disabilities is one of the largest, all right? And the interesting part of it is it is highly unpredictable because today you are able-bodied, your any other diversity factor may take time to switch, but disability can happen anytime, right? So there is only a thin gap between being able-bodied and disabled. So if you look at other elements of diversity, religion, LGBT, all those factors that you have, right? That the, 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 the period is longer, but in disability, it's not the case. So it's about 2 billion people by 2050 is what is expected. Women experience disability by far than men. However, there is a lot of discussion going around this in terms of the new age intellectual disabilities that are coming up. So we find, for example, boys are reported to have more autism I'm more on the autism spectrum than girl child, right? So as the data is coming out, we see that there is new information coming out. More older people have PWD or are people with disabilities than the younger people, which is out there. That is because of the comorbidity issue. So disability can exist simultaneously with old age. So you're, somebody becomes diabetic, diabetes leads to loss of uh, eyesight, right? So diabetes leads to amputation. So that's where we see older people and our disability. Low income countries have more people with disability than higher income, uh, income countries. So Asia, for example, is a big hub of people with disabilities, which is out there. So this also translates into a lot of economic percentages and job losses that we, so the whole thing we see, you know, is very cyclical. They are all interlinked which is out there. So if I'm saying Asia is the next big hub of supply chain and almost 15% of my population is disabled. So how, what, where are the finances? Where are the economics working? All that sort of confusion starts. Today, the disability has moved beyond medical and physical to include physical, social, political, environmental context. I will just talk about it in the next slide. And PWD, people with disabilities also experience three times more violence than those without disability. So physical violence, abuse, all those sort of issues that you see are higher for people with disabilities. So why today disability is important? Actually, if you use the lens of disability with what I'm giving you right now on your immediate friends and family circle, you will find 
that those you thought are able today are technically defined disabled. In many, many countries of the world, or rather most countries of the world, including Indonesia today, disability is a larger term. It includes terms like AIDS, cancer, diabetes, lupus, arthritis. It includes environmental disabilities. For example, Fukushima, what has happened? Terrorism-based disabilities, learning disabilities. And we always have the classical military or the war disabled, the veterans. But I will not account for them because traditionally in the disability, the war veterans have a more better position, you know, because they've sacrificed their lives or their body parts fighting the war than the civilians or people normal or regular people like you and me who have not been into the army. So they have more privileges because they get taken care of by the government more than uh, the other people which is out there, okay? So when I'm talking today of disability per se, it is more to do with the, the non-military part of it that I'm talking about, okay? So what happens for people with disability typically? Most people with disability are marginalized. They are not mainstream. I'll be very honest. I am very privileged as a person with disability to work in the higher education sector. I have met very few colleagues and we form a close bond who are equally people with disabilities and who pay their own tax. For me to pay my own tax is a, is a thing of validation for my own identity that I'm not depending on anybody. I can. I have that privilege, but I don't want to because it impacts who you are as a contributing member of the society. Most people with disabilities live on the fringes or are marginalized. We have another problem that we see, if you see the last slide, last slide it says urban disability versus rural disability. Most of our understanding of disability is urban in nature. So people with disability living in the cities or towns, you know, that we have, which is out there, we don't see the people who are in the rural parts, in the farms, you know, in the villages. There's a big chunk of disability that is happening. Now for a minute, I want you to think that the challenge of reaching out to these people in the rural segments, if the rural population forms 60% of the national population, and out of that 15% of people with disabilities are there, the biggest chunk of people with disability therefore is in the rural segment. And there's a huge amount of marginalization. There are also the invisible population. I can definitely say that in Indonesia, definitely. My five years of living and working I rarely meet people who are disabled in the shopping malls. Interestingly, interestingly, in Jakarta, all these facilities are accessible. If you take the top 10 malls in Jakarta, if you're on a wheelchair or you know you have talking lifts, you have Sanayan has a braille lift also, they're all accessible. But you don't see those people socializing or going out, which is there. Right? So they become hidden population, shame at times. Then we see is social and political exclusion. Social and political exclusion. Let me just share an interesting uh, observation I had. Uh, in the last week, we saw mass protests uh, on the streets of Jakarta, you know, against the, uh, the work laws which happened. If you see the videos which I saw, everybody who was protesting on the streets were able-bodied people. You didn't see people on wheelchairs or disabled groups, part of that, you know, leading that, which is out there, right? Work is also important to them. They're also entrepreneurs. If the law gets approved or disapproved, it also has connections with them, but we don't see representation that happened. Poor access to education and training. So, uh, if we say that, we say that the government has 2% quota, you know, uh, for people to work with disability, 
the first question business has where are those people with disability because we don't have good special needs schools or mainstream integration of children with disability then we also see technology alienation everybody is using today new types of technology is this technology you know accessible to people with disability which is out there right across different age groups uh which is uh, which is uh, existing out there uh we see 50% of them 50% of people with disability are more likely to live in poverty so if this is the background that we are talking about disability this is the background everyday story we now look at what is the challenge of covid that then i look at the overlapping of these two issues so when covid has arrived and covid is just one illustration in this context covid is just a case study of people with disability i am talking now of any major pandemic maybe because covid is extended for so long we are now looking at it what happened during sars or before that you know different other diseases uh, that have come uh, all those have an impact so in the highlight of covid 19 as a case we see 1 million people reported death nearly all countries of the world are affected 35 million people affected worldwide we still don't know what is the full scale impact of this disease how long it is going to be right and it has created an unprecedented health crisis we see people with disabilities depend a lot on the public health crisis public health system or any sort of medical system which is out there so if it is already under pressure because of covid 19 the question is what it means for people with disability okay we see some uh, discussion around that now i'm talking about the covid 19 and people with disability it is now looks uh, we are pretty early in terms of the research that is happening as far as covid 19 and people with disability are concerned very few studies in fact i am not aware of uh, any strong studies which has come out from indonesia we will just see some discussions around ilo uh that has happened around indonesia workplace and people with disabilities but not much information uh we are seeing uh except one or two astray articles which is out there we see that covid 19 can impact people with disability the most because of their fragile position and therefore they are a very high risk category people with disability today are facing uh, because of covid 19 discrimination violence barriers from accessing information education and services uh, which is out there right suddenly we must understand the problem of covid 19 or modern age situation or diseases is access to timely information timely information which is out there i know my friends who are blind or who have visual impairment at this point in time they are facing one of the largest challenges because information so much information is coming out but the websites are not audible newspapers are not audible which is out there so many of us what we are doing is we read out create pdf files and are mailing and putting into public repository so people can just pick up so if you you can find some of my auditory voices because i have i can read i can convert it into a pdf file i've just read out jakarta post made a pdf and put it out in the repository so any blind person who's within indonesia my friends or overseas can just hear what is happening in indonesia because the files are not audible which is out there so so access to information is becoming important the big challenge also is women and girls with disabilities are at very high risk so what has happened is this whole situation is forcing us to stay indoors within closed spaces and we see where there is already high risk situation the kind of abuse scenario can become more aggravated so women and girls with disabilities are therefore at a high risk there is also a very high risk of gender based violence and sexual and reproductive health 
that, that is being compromised at this point in time. One of the studies uh, that was just recently done in Australia, and this is an independent Australian study, they found that people with disability are also reporting 91% of the people reported increased expenses. So your, your cost of, uh, cost of your uh, meeting with your disability needs is higher. I will give you a simple example. In my case, I use very high-end batteries uh, for my hearing aids. I do wear microphones in my ears and the product is not available in Indonesia at this point in time. A regular battery, which costs 10,000 rupiah, is today from an import process costing me, 10 batteries cost me 140,000 Indonesian rupiah. So from 10,000 rupiah packet, I've gone to 140,000 rupiah. Just to give you an example, that's your equipment usage your support system, your networks, depending on the kind of disability, medicines, all those kind of things are increasing. One more important, uh, important thing for us to understand is that people with disabilities usually do not have one disorder. Because your whole body uh, in some form is impacted, typically you live with one or two challenges which is out there, other than your main disability. Number two is your disability also many cases is progressive. So you, you are 10% disabled, then you become 20%, 30%, depending on how your body or circumstances or situation is going around. So the increase in expense, especially during COVID-19 is being felt much higher. We see that in many Western countries, we have the concept of disability support pension. So where you pay high taxes, right? You're paying in Australia about 45 or 50% of your salary is going as taxes. The government has a provision for disability support pension. We see such concepts do not exist in our Asian countries, or if they do, that's just meager, very, very little amount of money that is coming basically. 66% of PWD reported changes in their income during the COVID, which is out there. What has happened in this case is basically the nature of the job for people with disability has changed completely, completely in many situations. So one school of thought today is talking, oh, you know, for people with disability, it is great. We see in the next slide where you can do telework, you can work from home, you know, it is easier, you don't have to travel. But again, it depends on the kind of disability. For somebody like me or people who are with hearing impairment, Working from home is an absolute nightmare. I have a special accessible classroom in Venus, which allows me to interact with my student and manage my disability very well and yet score a high teaching and learning uh, record, which I would have. My biggest worry teaching online was, will I have a good TLI? Will my students understand me? Because I'm using technology, I just cannot go closer to them, which is out. So the nature of the work has changed, which is out. Right? So that is one part of it. Loss of support. Uh, we see working fewer hours. Many people with disability also have a core issue of fatigue. So they cannot work for long periods of time. So people are now being paid less in accordance with that. But that is also a challenge that we are seeing. Loss of support, both national disability insurance schemes and for the non deaths which is out there. Loss of support means you will see that many people with disability actually have help who come home. So to bathe them, to help them get up, to do their everyday chores. Now, in the case of COVID, where I have to live in isolation completely by myself, you know, I have no help. I'm more fatigued, I'm more tired as a person with disability. So there is a complete loss of support. So it is affecting my overall persona, which is, a, that's what is happening to larger people with disability. So we see, however, one of the things that has improved and more again in the Western countries is the telehealth, where uh, people with disability don't have to physically go. Certainly people realize, okay, you know, you can solve a lot of medical facilities and all you can get through online. So we see that telehealth possibly is one of the 
positive outcomes of this COVID. It happened, that's happened in Australia. So when we see is uh, the World Health Organization, what it is, uh, what it is talking to, it's very interesting if you see uh, basic hygiene measures uh, is challenging. I have friends on wheelchair uh, who are going to the malls and you find uh, that, you know, they would typically not go into the mall and go into the washroom. So if you go to the Pondokinda mall, uh, which is in Pondokinda, the, the toilets to the mushola and the female and male toilets, you just in Pondokinda one in three, you cannot access your wheelchair. But you want to wash your hands, right? Because that is what the government is telling you, wash your hands, wash your hands. But they cannot wash their hands, you know, because typically they would not go to the toilet. They will go to the mall for an hour, come back, you know, home, use the home system. But now if they're going to the mall, they, they want to do that. They cannot do that. So accessibility is becoming a problem, uh, which is out there. So difficulty in enacting social distance because of additional support or because they are institutionalized. So institutionalization means where people with disabilities do not live with their family members. So for example, we have the Rachel House in Jakarta, which is basically a palliative care uh, center for children with uh, uh, cancer uh, and other issues. Or uh, we have uh, uh, the Cheshire Home for people with disabilities who are living in an institution uh, in Chilandak, which is out there. How, how are they? For them, it's very difficult to maintain the social distance. Somebody needs to push them. Somebody needs to show them the direction. That's where the challenge is coming for. So social distancing is becoming a problem, uh, especially for people uh, who are blind or who have visual impairment. Everything is touch-based. They touch your face to know who's talking, right? They touch your hand. They touch everything. And what we are saying, everything needs to be sanitized. You cannot touch. So, the loss of the human touch possibly is being felt most by people with disabilities, I find it. A lack of access to public health. Uh, absence to public health is, uh, I do a lot of physiotherapy. The first question my physiotherapist asked, uh, my physiotherapist knows uh, that I'm a person with disability. They said, Sanju, if required, don't come. So I don't have access because they're worried that I can be at risk. So you are shown physiotherapy online. So I'm supposed to give my own self a massage. I, I have, I want to pay, I can afford it, but I don't have accessibility, right? So those, the, 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 the risk of developing some of the disease prevents us from socializing at this point in time. Uh, barriers to accessing uh, healthcare overall, uh, that is just to put it, that is what the WHO is saying. So I would like to share that there are, the way I see it as an academic and a person with disability is that there are 10 total barriers uh, as far as people with disability are concerned. First is isolation, fear, grief, and safety concerns, uh, which are out there. The nature of the COVID, or any pandemic is that it demands isolation. It demands that people don't come closer to you. Fear and grief, which is out there. So it is, it is, that is the first barrier we are dealing, people with disability are dealing with. Second is, there is a need for more self-dependency -de and there's a disruption in routine. You will see people with disabilities, most of the time, the reason they succeed where they succeed is because they have very well-defined routines. So they know after this, this is what I will do. After this, this is what I will do. There's a structure, right? And we see that routine has undergone a major shift. Suddenly, I have to go to buy grocery at 7 a.m. in the morning. I have no clue because that's when the number of people are, uh, are the few. So I have the lowest risk of uh, uh, getting uh, an infection, which is out there. So safety concern. Uh, we also see is taboo of COVID patients and families. So where this is especially useful uh, for us to understand the challenge of people with disability where they're using help. So a lot of people uh, within, we know uh, people with disabilities, for example, if they have a EPO or a park at home, whether it is, you know, uh, a pimpantu or a driver or a help system, which is out there, people are afraid. 
So you're not getting the regular help. So that's where the taboo of the COVID is coming out, which is it. The fourth barrier is constant flow of new information. If you recall from March 18th to April 18th, if you go to the Indonesian websites uh, of the governor, as well as uh, President Jokowi's websites, or you see any of the top newspapers which is out there, everybody is telling you different things to do about COVID, right? So there's a constant, so people with abilities themselves are drowning under information. So processing of information. And the second challenge is the secondhand information. So if I'm borrowing information from somebody through WhatsApp forwards, it is diluted, misrepresented, misleading, may not be applicable to me as a person with disability. So that's the second problem. Fifth is adapting to the new environment, workplace, uh, marketplace, your your entire life, the way you're dealing with it for people with disability along with your disability. One simple example I will share with you is that most people with disabilities in Jakarta, for example, who are on wheelchair, they use only one wheelchair, okay? So the same wheelchair, they go out, they move around and then they bring the wheelchair home. But since the COVID-19 has started, they have to keep the wheelchair outside sanitize it for 24 to 36 hours and then take it inside. So it's great inconvenience when you're in the home, you cannot use your wheelchair again, right? So that sort of issues of adapting and accessibility that we are seeing. Then we are seeing is the challenge of leading the life in the digital world. As of now, I just talked about the challenge of people with hearing impairment. We are also seeing data where people have epilepsy, People have intellectual disability where they cannot spend long time on the screen. So long screen exposure is affecting their minds, the way, the way they are thinking, the processing of information. That's what is happening, right? Then we see is, this is the most important. If you see point eight and point 10, participation in decision-making. People with disability are not included in COVID-19 in deciding uh, their life, their choices, or their preferences, which is out there, right? Because if I don't have a participation in, in the decision-making, whether it is micro decision or a macro decision, my consent is not taken for anything. I will give you a very interesting example. In the forthcoming United States uh, November election, uh, November election, one of the biggest challenges that the disability groups are going to face is, and they are already discussing, is how people with disabilities are going to vote because they want to vote. They want to be part of the political decision making of United States of America. So if I want to vote and if I'm an American on a wheelchair or I have a disability, you know, how safe is my voting environment going to be for me able to? Vote? So that's the kind of decision making that I'm talking about. Underlying medical conditions, if people already have some other issues, you know, along with that. And then we see is livelihood and income generation. Many people with disabilities do not work in the formal economy. They work in what we call as the informal economy. So they're entrepreneurs in nature. So you'll be surprised to know a lot of the bread and uh, the kui, uh, the food products that if you are in Jakarta, uh, that you use, you know, a lot of people employ people with disability in the back end, which is out, especially in the food sector, which is, that's an easy skill for people with disability. And we see there is a loss of livelihood because there is no economy which is working, which is there, okay? Uh, one of the new things that has emerged, and this has got nothing to do with people with existing disability, is the mental health and the psychosocial care. And I think this is very interesting because suddenly everybody is talking, hey, you know, it's COVID-19, I'm not feeling good. You know, I'm feeling depressed, I'm sad. 
I'm not happy. It's exactly like something what happened during the world wars, right? People are now facing situations which are mental health and psychological social required because, not because they're people with disability, but because of the COVID-19. Now it has two things to it. The advantage of it is people are increasingly being becoming sensitive to the idea or understanding to other people with this sort of disabilities. But the second thing is it also is creating many workplace and domestic stress. So if I'm an able-bodied person and I'm facing stressful, I can get very irritated easily or lose my normal uh, way of working or behaving and can be insensitive to a person with disability. Right? So that's where the mental health and psychosocial care is coming around. So what does the new normal mean for people with disability? Uh, there are three positions that I would like to share is PWD, people with disability and medical support and new normal workplace support and social support. So the first is that people with disability cannot be or should not be denied of medical treatment based on the on their disability, which is out there, right? They deserve equal amount of medical attention, uh, which is which is out there. So we saw certain decisions being taken in certain countries, especially if you remember in Italy around April when they were facing the large numbers, people with disabilities and senior citizens were asked to go away from the hospitals and only able-bodied people because it became the issue of what we call a survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest theory that happened. Who will survive and who will do the best? Let them get the facilities for, for COVID, right? What people, organizations of disabilities are now saying, you cannot do that. Everybody deserves a chance, which is out there. Ensure prior testing of persons with disabilities presenting the symptoms. Uh, promote the impact of COVID on health of persons with disability. Create awareness. Create awareness around that, uh, which is out there. I must share a very interesting thing. You know, uh, in the last last six, uh, I've been home for now almost seven months. I have not stepped out of my home. Uh, I have uh, maybe just a couple of occasions that I went out to buy the groceries and uh, essentials, which is out there. And every time people have asked to meet me, I have declined. And at some point in time, people stopped calling me because they said she doesn't want to meet up. So there's always a way to talk to Zoom. And I realized in such situations, possibly it is because people, and this is very similar story where my other friends with disabilities or colleagues with disabilities are facing it, where people's awareness of people with this impact of COVID on people with disabilities is very low. So maybe uh, a regular person can handle five people, six people, maybe I cannot do that. Right? It's not the fear, it's the reality, but that awareness around that is very low around it. So continuous access and supply of medicines uh, for people with disabilities, which is out there, training and awareness of health workers uh, that we see. And uh, we, we feel that uh, there is very strong need for to create a representation. Uh, at least I'm not aware of COVID-19 people with disability representation in Indonesia. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, uh, maybe it is there, but uh, I'm not aware of that. But I definitely know of that in Malaysia, in Singapore, Philippines, uh, Australia, all these markets, uh, markets have had that, okay? Uh, we see the next element is people with disability workplace in the new normal is uh, occupational safety and health telework, flexible working hours, paid leave. Uh, people, people recognizing that, you know, people with COVID-19 can affect distinctly. Work arrangements to be accessible and inclusive, which is out there. Uh, which, uh, uh, and a uh, very important part is the third part is professional development through crisis. So if you remember 
uh, for the also for the students with disabilities it comes to because they are all forming a part of the supply chain today who are children with disabilities or student with disabilities tomorrow you become workforce with disabilities or uh, adults with disabilities like a supply chain in a country which is out there so continued professional development so you will be surprised to see in the last uh, six months if you look at your own self wow you would have learned so many new skills quickly right how to use zoom how to if you are if you are in higher education you know use whatsapp or different types of apps link it teaching structures you know creating video based learning things which is out there it comes easily but for people with disabilities it's a huge challenge it's a huge challenge i can for sure tell you i have not slept for 3 months because i want to be as competitive as my colleagues are because you don't want to take the benefit you know or the doubt oh she's a person with disability you don't want that you want to be competitive and you want to constantly skill yourself so we feel that the professional skilling staying at the top of your game is very important for people with disabilities uh, which is out there okay uh so we are saying is that uh, one of the one of the things uh, that we are seeing is that as we move out maybe the world will become more accessible because of technology part of it and uh, yet you see all types of technology will not be useful for all types of disability because there are different types of disability that we have which is out there but we are hoping that it will create a more inclusive workplace for people with disability uh we also see is the social protection i just have few more slides uh just five more minutes pak arrow is it okay okay so uh one is uh what we are seeing this is happening this is ilo guideline is talking is there must be cash transfers that should be done with people with disabilities in countries where especially in the rural segment in kind support food buying out medicines you know groceries that sort of support or delivery mechanisms and maintaining and developing support systems for pwd is required which is there uh again a big challenge in the asian system uh, that we see usually these kind of jobs are done uh by the family members or close friends you will see not everybody is uh, uh has that but we see in the western setup they have come up very quickly with to address the system in fact uh, i i will just show you some examples around that uh so uh we see is that today ilo has basically come up with a framework they are saying if it is a person with disability during the lockdown what are the different things you should do if this is a socio economic process what are the things you should do and if it is a recovery phase i want to show you some examples in united arab emirates they have launched a national programs and people with disabilities were some of the earliest people to be tested and 650000 tests of people with disabilities was done in uh, united arab emirates which is out there right so the test kits but first brought for people with disabilities because they are the most vulnerable group which is out there so that's where the testing started happening in philippines the commission of human rights has published information on health groups public messages children people with disabilities customized information which is out for people with people with disabilities out there in canada they formed this is a specific group i'm talking about disability advisory group uh, they are also advising the government what to do so you see the problem is not just that the government is talking to people with disability it is also the disability groups that need to collect the information and take it back to the government so there is a two way interaction which is required for for this uh, to happen uh, in switzerland and spain people with disabilities who were living in institutions were sent home uh with packages so they don't have to survive in the institutions uh, which is out there uh in argentina uh if you are working for a person with disability you are not fined or you are exempted from tax you have easy so if it is a lockdown for example and i am a nurse and i offer support to a person with disability 
I go as a part of the important essential services which is out there. So that is recognized in the system which is uh, which is out there, okay. And uh, in UK and uh, Great Britain, we see that there was uh, relaxed to a lot of confinement. Uh, this was very interesting. Uh, in in uh, they did so they opened the public spaces right only for people with disability. So suppose if I am a person with autism or if I'm a person with, uh, you know, on a wheelchair and I need more physical space. I go to the park, which is closed for the normal people, but I can access it. So it allows me that breathing space because I need more physical space than a regular person, which is that, okay? So uh, what we see is, uh, this is the role of the state, financial aid for persons with disabilities, uh, disability benefits, if until now, for example, in many Asian countries, we don't have that. We need to create that. We need to make access. For example, many countries do not even have a disability card. So if I were to ask in your group, you know, of 200, 300 students who are 255 students, if any one of you has, is a person with disability, how do you identify yourself? Because the state doesn't recognize. So a disability card, you know, identification process becomes important, which is out there. Uh, so finally, what we are seeing for people with disability in the new normal means, it is a multi-stakeholder approach, community, disability service providers, government, private sector, healthcare professionals, and public services, which is out there. Uh, so that's where I would like to end my presentation. Thank you, everybody, for a very uh, patient listening. <laughs> Back it up, please advise. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Sangju. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to, uh, what do you call that, conclude, but you have heard that uh, disabilities has, people with disabilities in our country, especially, has not been involved in many uh, aspects of life yet um, they are marginalized so uh, and uh, but during the pandemic especially as much as the people with disabilities are uh, nervous with these situations we are people without disabilities also <laughs> experiencing the same th uh, panic and ncats as well but uh, let's come to the next uh, session uh, we are going to uh, open questions. We have several questions already from. Uh, I think uh, I see a question. Can I take the question back? Yes, you. Okay. You so I have a question from Kenix Kimberly from Venus. Uh, she says, with these one since COVID, disabilities managed to help from others as much as they need with these months, did disability people. Yes, uh, so to answer Kenneth's question, at this point in time, the whole thing is on the charity model, right? <laughs> so you are getting something because somebody is just being kind and nice to you. So there's a difference between charity and right. What now we are talking about is right. Is the right of people with disabilities in any country less than those who are not disabled, right? So what happens for a long time in the disability history, we have argued that people with disabilities are second class citizens, right? So their rights are not respected and uh, you know they are not, so they have to fight for everything which is out there. So to answer your question, uh, people have depended in the COVID charities, friends, families, um, Yaya San is helping, you know, that sort of, but it is not something that I must get, that sort of a thing of planning has not come across. You will not see any specific policies, uh, you know, that have been announced in many ASEAN countries to say disability people, this is the new policy. ILO has come out, WHO is recommending, we are signers of UNCHRD, you know, all those laws we have signed. But when it is com coming to enforcing those laws or implementing those laws, it's not happening, okay? Uh, so the second question I'm looking at is from Alice Bulan. How should Indonesia government think about new normal for people with disabilities in India? What is the most important? 
So I think the first important thing is to immediately have is a dialogue through the presentation of people with disabilities. And very important is also constant uh, collection of data. So that is, how do I monitor if the population is invisible? I think this is the perfect time for government of Indonesia to launch a disability card, you know, where you get classified out, you know, this is a person with disability. We don't have that sort of, you know, numbers to know who exactly is a person with disability. Sometimes you see in Indonesia, a person has one finger missing and they call themselves people with disability, you know, just one finger missing, but that's not really disability. So uh, uh, that understanding of disability will help. So the cross dialogue between the sectors uh, is what will be important. Okay, I'm then looking at a question from Rifka. What are the most okay. difficult problems that PWD face when they're in public areas? What do they expect from the social condition and public places? There are a lot of disabilities. How do we provide public places that can be used for them? Uh, in Indonesia, one challenge is physical space uh, because we are a high density country. So uh, one of the big, uh, big thing uh, for the public spaces is creating a, a specific zone or giving that assurance, you know, to, so for example, if I go into a mall and I'm not using my own wheelchair, I'm using a mall wheelchair, right? I want to be very assured that the wheelchair has been thoroughly cleaned or there is a designated space, you know, there is a designated person which is, who's out there to handle. So if you walk into the mall, you know, uh, you want to go to the information counter, there is nobody specifically for person with disability. So we need designated segments, people who are responsible to address the queries of people with disabilities, which is out there. So if you look at your MRT, you know, the mass uh, railway that we are using, which is out there, can there be specific designated coach, which can be given to people with disability, you know, or Trans Jakarta, you know, we are running that. So I know that as a person with disability, you know, I can do that, uh, for example, with Bluebird. So if I inform Bluebird beforehand that, you know, I'm a person with disability, I get a very specific driver who understands that. But we don't see that that's a private service in the public segment. So that sort of, a, uh, that sort of a thing would really help. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, Rochelle is asking, is uh, Rochelle, Sharans Sh Sh Rochelle is saying, how people with disabilities make conversation with other people with disability? Well, uh, I can, the mask is an issue for people who are hearing impaired, uh, which is even for blind people, because the voice gets very muffled, which is out there. Uh, so there is no right way, it is a very hard way. So in my way, I talk to my friends in WhatsApp, even on a face-to-face. -face. So if I were to meet you outside, we are talking only through WhatsApp. And uh, it is not just with, uh, you will see that not just people, it is even with your family members. If I'm out uh, going or stepping out, or I'm talking to my husband or my child, we prefer to talk through WhatsApp because I don't understand what they're talking. Otherwise, if they're wearing a mask, which is there. Uh, so it is challenging. Mm. Another question as individuals. I'm seeing Maria's question. Uh, it's about stigma. Yes. So yeah. disability is, is, is a big stigma, which is out there. I think the best way to make disability or not stigma is, is to make people with disability visible. And that is where I am a strong proponent of the quota system. So if I were to say, if 100 students are being admitted in a university, at least 2% of the quota should be for people with disabilities, you know? So that's how you start the process or at workplace, which is out there. Uh, there is a lot of awareness required even in the generation X, but I think the millennials and the zenials are more open uh, about disability or understanding disability. So uh, inclusivity, you know, one of the best things I tell you is to look at diversity. If you have 10 friends and you're a university student, I want to ask you how many of your friends are different from each other. And if all your friends are same type, so they speak the same language, they go to the same university, they come from the same religion, 
there is trouble. It means you are not diversified enough, you know. So making that attempt to make your, your, your group more diversified will allow you to remove the stigma part of it. Okay. Uh, uh, Luthi, Luthi's question, Khairun, uh, Khairunisa's question is, uh, what are the Indonesian government done to help people with disability? Do you think it fits the expectation? Uh, I think it's very little. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, which is very interesting, because Indonesia has all the laws in place. So legally, we are absolutely compliant. Uh, Indonesia has everything in place. But I think what has also happened is uh, that is a, that is not in Indonesia, but that is the truth of the developing countries is that because the development started late, uh, we are so busy empowering already able-bodied people that we forget people who are who are not able-bodied or who are not able-bodied male. So you will see that one of the very interesting data is. In the disability, men who are disabled get more jobs than women who are disabled who get jobs. So you are facing a bias with, within the disability itself, which is out there. You know, it makes me very angry at times. But uh, it is it is just just the whole thing that the man thing, you know the gender issue also becomes, so we call it intersectionality theory. So if I intersect gender, women, disabled, with another factor, we see they are at the bottom. So if you were to do it in Indonesia, the intersectionality, you will find Muslim women, disabled, uh, will be at the bottom of the hierarchy because you see triple intersectionality of religion, you see gender, and then you see disability. So that just brings them down. So we need to work using, so we don't use disabled as a larger classification. We need to look at micro classification. And again, urban. So you will not see the rural part. You know, if it is a Muslim rural disabled woman, she is possibly in the most difficult situation in Indonesia today. So that's where we are seeing, which is there. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at we'll Sultan's kind of... questions. Yeah, it's an interesting question uh, before I go back to Kathleen's question. Uh, I just want uh, Yeah, many questions. So, uh, yes, uh, 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 there is one is socioeconomic uh, division, right? So what, what uh, Sultan's question is asking is that, uh, if there is an able-bodied person, but he is already very poor, and he sees that a person with disability gets more benefits, you know, and he's not getting it, he it may create a sort of social jealousy. I think that that's where the overall role of people with disability within the larger national and economic policies need to be established. Okay, it is not just people with disability; it will also happen with women. Right. So if a man, able-bodied, low socioeconomic profile person sees that a woman is drawing more money or salary, he may get jealous with that. So I don't think I don't think we can uh, we can segment it out like that. I think it is the larger role or contribution of, you know, the societal members and their position in the economic theory of the country is what needs to be understood. But what is important, you must understand. Why I propose, uh, always I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for the quota system for people with disability is because people with disabilities have what we call as historical legacy, which normal people uh, with uh, able-bodied people don't have. So for years, even if you give a person with disability a job, the kind of bias and stereotyping they will face at workplace will be far more then a person with lower economic situation will go. To give you a small example, you may, or you may be interested to know that leprosy is considered to be a form of disability, leper, lepers, you know, if you know leprosy. And it has very deep biblical connotations uh, to, to that as a form of disability. In many countries, leprosy, people who are healed lepers can get back work, but you'll be surprised that nobody may talk to them at work or even shake hands with them. 
that is not similar as a person with you know social economic profile so you go to the work you're a heel leper but you don't have an environment that allows you to succeed which is out there in that case you need a reservation and you need more social awareness which is around there. because the taboo or the fear is so strongly associated with that particular form of disease you'll be surprised to know many people with disabilities do not get invited to auspicious occasions because they considered to be bad luck because they bring bad luck right so these are very strong social taboos i cannot just make them disappear with one economic policy they need to be worked around with lot of lot of awareness which is out there okay uh okay i go back to the earlier question of kathleen uh, madeline uh, how can disability awareness be raised especially in indonesia looking at the boo and younger generation to raise the awareness which is out there i think i think it is it is very very possible uh to 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 raise the awareness the raising of awareness i say if there are about 254 of you if my presentation has made even a 1% difference i see i have 254 soldiers who will talk about disability today at their dining table with their family or friends so the whole process of disability awareness stems from us you know or uh, creating social campaigns you see uh, creating more visibility for people with disability or focusing more on their abilities rather than their disability that's where the campaign starts from okay i'm looking at uh, timothy's question from binos timothy yeah mm -hmm. uh yeah i would like to ask what's the best for pwd to during the do they do online therapy and how identify uh so uh a lot of people do yes are doing therapies depending on the kind of disabilities uh, that they have uh, some people don't need therapies for their disability they just want to lead their normal life you know they just want to go around leading their life which is out there so i, I in this context i will say a personal my personal example my big challenge in the last 7 months has been to be normal with my abnormality you know how i can go on doing teaching normally how i can get my students don't feel the difference you know how i can still be an effective member uh, of my group in the whatsapp and be a contributing member which is out there which is uh, which is part of it uh, for some people where the disability has taken a very sharp turn you know some some people the disability has progressed anxiety attacks and all those kind of things those are the situations where people are uh, using therapies there is also a lot of pressure for the families young people with disabilities have families so for example several of my friends are disabled and they are newly married or they have young children so for them to be able to manage a life uh, you know has become very challenging so they have no help so she may not reply an email in one day she will reply 20 days or 15 days but her mail clearly says i am a person with disability i'm coping with a challenge please bear with me you know that sort of a thing uh, which is uh, which is becoming important uh, as far as the talent part of it is concerned that is that is uh, uh, talent is a very uh, uh, very uh, again there is a stereotype associated for people with disabilities and talent for example one of the biggest stereotype is that all blind people are very good singers <laughs> everybody assumes that if you are blind you will be a very good singer there's a big assumption around it right because it's a unique gift you will you will hear a very popular saying in in any in any communities when god takes away one organ he endorses the person with another organ okay i'm really trying to find out which part of me is that since i became disabled 15 years ago so uh, but it's actually not like that for everybody you know that's a case stereotype with disability as a talent a talent which is out there what is important is skilling so one is uh, the talent is is something you inherently have skilling is something i can teach you in the modern day we need more skilling but yes many companies today have started recognizing that they can tap 
the inherent talent and not use people with disability you know paint them in the same brush i will give you an example many it companies for example have found that people who are autism have great num numerical skills okay they have a great numerical talent they are very good in coding for example or processing of data but they cannot work in the normal environment so they have created special rooms for people with disabilities at at workplace where these people can work for me myself in binos i am given a very special room my room is very special where i conduct my class 202 that is the most accessible room that allows me to interact with my students it has television screens my students can type so for me it is not about talent for me it is about accessibility that allows me to enhance my skill as a person with disability and yet compete on the same parameters or kpi you know as my other colleagues would be uh, would be doing okay all right i think i would take the last question from onjani is it okay pakiro yes go on so uh <laughs> thank you very much uh, for your kind words i believe in fake it till you make it so that has been my mantra for last 15 years i think for me the advantage also i always remain grateful to god uh for giving me the gift of uh continuing my profession and my advantage of my first masters of being a communications person uh but if any one of you has uh disabilities or if you have family members as a person with disability i request you to look at them with a very different light don't stop meeting people or being friends with disability dating people with disabilities marrying people with disabilities you know or enjoying the company of people with disabilities uh, which is uh, which is uh, out there because they bring a very different perspective and as i always say there is a very thin line between being able bodied and being disabled uh, so i wish you all the very best and thank you very much yeah thank you very much ms anju uh you answer almost all of the questions and i see there are three kinds of aspect i've been asked yeah? first how did you and um, other disabilities people with disabilities cope during the pandemic of the covid-19 which is especially to your condition you cannot hear and people are wearing masks and that's why you really impressed with the woman who posted the mask that shows the mouth the transparent and but what about uh government you say that it's it's a right it's not it's not a demand we disabilities has right that has to be provided but yeah, as you can see that uh, it's not been uh, concerned like uh, if you are uh, a woman you are pregnant and you cannot speak and you cannot hear and you go to the hospital and how are you going to tell your condition if the nurses cannot understand you and they are not trained okay, to understand okay no, very interesting yeah. one in one situation the nurse actually asked if you are a person with disability who asked you to have a baby so your basic right to your body your biology right is questioned because it so you will be interested to know for many years in many countries people with disabilities were not allowed to marry or procreate for the same reason breaking to your point that's a shocking <laughs> uh, information and also for everyone uh, I, i'm not um, making it as a threat or giving you something uh, like a nightmare or what but like miss anju said before miss anju said that disabilities can come along um, the way not since where you were born so and women are um has more higher higher risk to have disabilities but uh, risk today is also uh, disabilities can be caused by diabetes diabetes and everything else what is the problem uh, it's not been concern as much as we are concerned to the needs of the people without disabilities but um yeah it's a it's very interesting discussion actually that uh, uh simple matters 
like uh, when people are building roads, they don't really concern about making pedestrians. <laughs> Let alone making pedestrians uh, familiar or uh, uh, facilitates the this people with disabilities, those with uh, wheelchairs and stuff like that. So yes, it's not been the concerns of our government that much. And also we are um, in Indonesia maybe are not well exposed to how to conduct ourselves among the disabled and the communication skills uh, to those who cannot speak, to those who cannot see. It's also, it should be in the curriculum, I think, yeah, that among us live people with disabilities, something like that. But um, uh, I don't, I don't want to go further about it, but let's uh, go to the, I don't see any more questions. Eh? I'm, I don't know, uh, I'm surprised. I'm happy to see so many question placed in the chat room. You know? I don't know whether you are doing it for the door price or <laughs> if you really want to make the questions, but yes, I'm surprised, I mean, this, uh, discussions concerns you as much if we have more discussion like this about disabilities people with disabilities and the possibilities of uh, the government and the society to provide each other so we can uh, live uh, we give a proper right to those with uh, disabilities it's gonna be more hum i don't know life can be more interesting yeah? because um somehow uh people with disabilities, um, they will struggle harder because they are with disabilities. Yeah. They will struggle, they will uh, try harder to maximize what they have. Like my students, for example, if they are smart, they tend to be lazy. If they have a lot of disabilities, very little uh, equipment to survive, they tend to be more diligent. <laughs> so people with disabilities tend to excel more <laughs> somehow. But yes, they have to pay a lot of money to, uh, to, to have their support systems. It's unfair. <laughs> disabilities, and then you have to pay more for your support systems. I've spent eight years of my life to reskill from mainstream spending back in reskilling. So you lose eight years of your earning because you're reskilling yourself and then you don't know how long because again if there is a disability you need to again study something more <laughs> so it's for it's for most i agree with you that's a paradox <laughs> the paradox yes but yeah uh, i know sometimes uh, if we don't have disabilities it doesn't relate to us but um yeah uh, i like the questions that, uh, from kathleen what can we do as the younger generation to raise those awareness? You know? Like to, to not to think that disabilities as a taboo and then how to conduct ourselves among the disabilities. So yes, uh, Ibu Joan, uh, can I choose the questions that will win the door prize? Uh, I will give a very silly considerations because I don't know really how to choose these questions because all of the questions are actually very interesting and uh, to myself it's a very new uh, topic and uh, I'm ashamed myself not really concerned about this topic before I'm invited to this meeting so oh, yes the first question to uh, the first I would like to appreciate Kenix Kimberly's question because she's like the first to place the questions. And uh, she, her, she put her concern on how people with disabilities sort of uh, cope with the COVID-19, you know, with the, um, what, the lockdown and everything. So uh, Kenix Kimberly, and um, the second one I would go to, uh, with Kathleen Madeline, who is asking about the taboo and how the younger generation create, uh, raise awareness on it. And actually, it's a similar question, but uh, uh, from, I would like 
to go to government question about questioning government but yeah, everybody knows <laughs> that uh, our government is not but this question is very interesting to me from unjani unjani's questions uh, is uh, coming from seeing busanju as people with disabilities excel <laughs> from people uh, in many aspects from the people with abilities you know? <laughs> so i would like to go to in uh, anjani's uh, question as the number three so it is uh kenix kathleen and unjani uh, oh no no oh, uni uni from unjani so the name is uni wulandari yeah. is from unjani okay and then uh, do you have everything uh Bujon and uh, Mr. Ray, Raya. Raya. Uh, uh, just just make sure that everyone who has selected by you by Bapak Eros, uh, don't forget to contact us uh, through the email Biro Kerjasama at atmajaya.ac.id. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's. Yang kedua tadi siapa Pak Pak Eros? Yang nomor dua tadi siapa? Yang nomor duanya Kathleen. Kathleen dari dari Binus. The question is about tabu. Oh, tabu. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ya, yeah. ini memang banyak dari Binus yang bertanya. I wish I can choose more. I wish you provide more door prize. I would give everyone the door prize. <laughs> But yeah. Um, Uh, I don't want to conclude anything, but I think uh, what we have learned today that uh, people with disabilities need our concerns, not because we pity them, but they somehow have uh, ability to contribute to the society. If we neglect this, we might lose very important aspect to our life. Like if we neglect, for example, um, who's the physician physicist who, who cannot even he always on his wheelchair i forgot his name he talk about the um, theory of um redefining the theory of big bang or something oh, how can i forget about it i mean um people with disabilities uh, has also many times as more important things to offer to contribute to the society if we neglect this we gonna lose very important uh, contribution. We might lose, we might uh, miss something that might change the life of the people. So that's why uh, I hope what we have been doing today from uh, what from uh, 9.30 until now, uh, uh, raise the awareness of that uh, we can contribute to each other yeah i think that's it thank you very much i'm sorry for for maybe i'm creating my own stigma or my stereotype on but because um honestly busanju uh, you are very impressive to me I'm, i'm very impressed to how you cope because you are not uh, disabled from where you were born you disabled because of uh delivering something beautiful to the world and then you cope very well you know with this uh the spirit of coping uh with disabilities that you suddenly have when you are an adult it's like amazing to me and i hope it's also in, inspiring to others uh to the participants uh, of our talk today and that's it And I will um, return this uh, to Mr. Rainer. Thank you very much. Finally, we got the last session in this event that is closing, right? Um, thank you very much to our speaker, Madam Dr. Song Jukta, Mr. Doni Eros, and the audience entirely. May what, may what we conducted will be useful for us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for today. Uh, thank you and apologize previously if any words that less pleasing to the audience here. Don't forget to join 
our next uh, our next event. Remember, don't forget to still keep your distance to slow the spread of COVID-19. Follow the guidance from government and stay healthy, stay safe, stay at home for our beloved country. I'm Ignatius Rainer. See you again soon and have a good day, everyone.